I'm Karen Dodge, and I want to welcome you to Kaioki Baptist Church online worship service. Take the next little while along with us, away from the stressors of life, to connect with God through worship, music, and Bible teaching. You won't regret it. Our vision and mission is to declare God great, to demonstrate His love to others, and to be and make disciples of Jesus. For more information about Kaioki, including calendar events, or if you're interested in finding a great place to serve, we invite you to take a look around kaioki.org. The RA Fishathon Missions Fundraiser went very well, and now we'll look forward to enjoying their fresh catch. Join us this afternoon at 5 o'clock at the Pavilion on White Oak Road for Community Fish Fry and invite a friend or two to come along. The Kaioki Cruisers Spring 2021 Cruise-In will be held next Saturday, May 8th at the Pavilion from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. This will be a great day of food, music, fellowship, and a lot of classic vehicles. Bring your family and invite a few unchurched friends. As we navigated necessary changes during the pandemic, adjustments to worship services and Sunday school times were made several times. Everyone did very well working together. Thank you for doing your part and for being flexible. Beginning May 16th, we'll return to pre-COVID Sunday morning schedule with first worship service at 8.30, Sunday school 9.45, and second worship service at 11. Also on May 16th, we will honor and recognize our graduates with a special breakfast and then a time of encouragement in our second worship service. If you'd like to participate, please contact the church office or access the online registration before this coming Tuesday, May 4th. If you'd like to support the ministry of Kaioki, you can do so online or by using our mailing address. In a few minutes, we'll open our Bibles as we continue in the sermon series entitled Disciple. But right now, let's sing in worship of Christ our Savior. Your love sought me when I was low. A wanderer on a broken road. In shame, shackled my heart in down. I was lost in sin, but you brought me out.
Jesus, he is alive indeed. We believe, we believe that our God is alive and our hearts are free. We believe, we believe the King Jesus, he is alive indeed. King Jesus, he is alive indeed. It is great to have you with us today as we worship the Lord and, and now about to open His Word. It is a snapshot of what life and particularly worship is like in the, uh, in the church family of Kaioki Baptist Church. So it is uh, very meaningful to us that you would spend time with us. I want to share with you some, some news that's going to impact, especially those of you that would like to come be a part of of uh, our live worship services. Uh, maybe you're a part of the Kaioki family, or maybe you just want to test the waters. Uh, we will be in two weeks from today, on the 16th of May, we will be uh, going to a new schedule of service times on Sunday morning. We will have a worship at 8.30. We will have Bible study in Sunday school at 9.45. And then we will have a second worship hour at 11 o'clock. So you are all invited. We um, are grateful for the way that our, our church family has really adjusted throughout this past year plus now as the pan pandemic hit and everything kind of stopped in March and then we started slowly to uh, gather outside for several months in May. And, um, and now as we look at what God would have us do at this day and time, that's something that we, um, that we feel good about. So you can also go online at kaioki.org and get those times, but just something to, to plant with you and leave with you as, as, we look, as we look forward. I want to start today as, um, as, as we turn our attention to Scripture by asking you a question. And here it is. When is the last time that you were so excited about Jesus that you could bust through your skin? Did you, have, you ever, have you ever had a, had a moment, had a period in your life where Christ was everything to you? And you literally got, got tangled up because he was so um, exciting and he moved you, and you had to tell people. How long, has, how long has that been, if ever? Well, I want to share with you an incident that happened in my life, and it was more than just a momentary incident. Uh, when I began preaching over 30-plus years ago, I can recall going over my Sunday morning message. I would be looking at it while a student at seminary, I would, pre I would prepare, and then Saturday night, after Susan would go to, to bed, I would sit at our table uh, in our little uh, seminary apartment, and I would go over, and I would make sure that everything was as it needed to be, and I would just immerse myself in the Scripture that I would be preaching from the next morning. And sometimes on those Saturday nights, just me, the Lord, and His Word, I would just begin to weep at the, uh, at the wonder of God and His Word and how sweet 
and how relevant and how real and pertinent it was to my life and to the people that I knew would be hearing it the following mornings. Those, the following morning, those times um, were very powerful, personal, and, and electric. Well, move ahead about five years later, I was, um, I was woken up in bed early on, on a particular Sunday morning by my alarm clock radio, which woke me up every morning. And normally I was woken up by music, but I don't, and I can remember, how did, how did I accidentally set the channel to this particular channel? Because here's what I woke up to. Somebody was preaching. <laughs> A man was preaching, and, I, and, I, he, and li, he was not just preaching, he, was, he had passion, and he was excited about God and, and what, he, what, he was, what he was saying. On the other hand, here I was laying in bed, kind of shaking the cobwebs off, but as I just laid there for a few minutes, I was uninspired, I was emotionless, and I wanted to stay in bed. It just, the fact that a couple of hours from that point, I would be standing in a pulpit preaching God's Word, it, it was not a big deal to me. And that's what made it so much worse. The conv- As I lay there that particular Sunday morning, listening to this man, thinking to myself, I want what he's got again. At one time, I had it. I had that passion. I had that excitement. But it wasn't there that Sunday morning. And I couldn't remember the last time it had been there. What happened? What was wrong with me? I was doing all the things during the week that I was supposed to do. I... I loved God, at least I thought I did. I was, um, I was having my quiet times, I was praying, I was reading the Word. I love my wife and my daughter, uh, but it was like I didn't care. It was like no big deal. He had no lasting, at least to this point, impact on me. But here's what the Lord graciously showed me. I didn't need to be more like that preacher. Um, I needed to be more like Jesus. I needed to, to spend more time with Him. I needed, I needed to be more of a God-pleaser and less of a man-pleaser. I needed to see other people, the people that I would be speaking to. I, I needed to see them like Jesus saw them. In short, I needed to practice what Christ had called me to be, His disciple. His disciple. We are in a series that we are calling Disciple. And we're in that series because we have taken, are taking the year 2021 to look at what it means to be a part of Kaioki Baptist Church. We have this statement, a vision statement, a hope, a desire that we will declare the greatness of God as He transforms lives by loving and reaching people and making disciples of Jesus. Now, that day I described to you was long before I came to Kaioki, um, but it doesn't really matter because as I lay, lay in bed that morning, um, I was not much good to God. But, he, but here's what I learned. He was of much value to me. And so over the course of the decades, He has shown me that there is a reason, a purpose to life. We believe as a church that the Bible teaches us that the value, the purpose that He has us here is to, if, if you were to take our vision statement and whittle it down to three words, is to declare, 
It is to demonstrate and it is to disciple. We declare God and His greatness. We demonstrate the love of Christ to others. And we disciple. As His disciples, we disciple. We make disciples of people that look like Jesus. So we're really taking uh, several weeks to look at what it means to disciple. And, uh, and our definition of a disciple is somebody that's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. And so last week we really kind of focused on what it me- means to be committed to his mission. And so we're going to pick back up. We're, we're, we need to spend a little bit more time on being committed to his mission. So... <coughs> As always, we're going to pull out of the Word of God, and so I invite you to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible or you don't have uh, your, your cell phone, smartphone, where you can tap into a, to a Scripture, put me on pause, go grab one, and, uh, and come back, and we'll be here. All right, so Matthew 9 verse 35 and we're just going to read through the end of the chapter just a few verses Matthew 9 35 and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction when he saw the crowds he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You notice in these few verses that Matthew, the the writer of, uh, of this gospel, is just telling us. This is the end, and really it's the build-up to the second great discourse of Jesus in this gospel. Um, and Matthew just tells us what Jesus is doing. He's, he's going throughout the cities and, and the villages of particularly in, of, of Galilee, northern Galilee. And um, he's going into the synagogues and he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. And if you will recall, Matthew, like the other gospel writers, tell us that when Jesus began to preach, his message was essentially the same message that John the Baptist had been, and that is that the people were to repent. Because the, the, the kingdom was at hand. They were to repent. And so Matthew just tells us that as Jesus was going throughout all these towns, he was proclaiming, he was declaring the good news of the kingdom of God. Good news. It is something we must never forget, that the gospel, that the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ is is not bad. But it is a very, very good thing. And the reason that matters is because what Matthew tells us in verse 36. That Jesus looked at the people that he was speaking to, that he was preaching to, that he was proclaiming good news to, and he felt compassion for them. He looked at them, and uh, he saw something in their lives that evidently everybody didn't see. He saw into their souls, and he saw their struggles, he saw their weaknesses, he saw their sins, he saw the emptiness in their lives. We have been, as we've gone through this series on on Disciple, we've been we've been focusing on a particular song from the 70s or 80s and uh and just kind of borrowing from either the title or part of the song and and today i'd like to i'd like to i'm going to call the message someplace that he'd rather be 
And you may recognize that's just a line, a part of a line, from a song by Billy Joel, known as the pian- he called entitled the Piano Man. And it is it is a, a, just a fascinating look that Billy Joel writes about. It's actually an autobiographical song. He um, he writes about a gig he had as the uh, as the Piano Man in a nightclub in San Diego. And he recalls the different people that he would meet and that he would engage with and what their lives are like. Now, I'm not going to read to you the whole song, but I would like to just pull out parts of The Piano Man uh, because Billy Joel is brilliant in his description of people and I, I can't help but wonder how many of us either are the people in this song or we know people that are just like the ones that Billy Joel writes about and sings about. So let me just, let me just pull a few, of the, a, a few verses from The Piano Man. It's 9 o'clock on a Saturday. R- the regular crowd shuffles in. There's an old man sitting next to me making love to his tonic and gin. He says, son, can you play me a memory? I'm not really sure how it goes, but it's sad and it's sweet, and I knew it complete when I wore a younger man's clothes. Now John at the bar is a friend of mine. He gets me my drinks for free. and He's quick with a joke or light up your smoke, but there's some place that he'd rather be. He says, Bill, I believe this is killing me as a smile ran away from his face. Well, I'm sure that I could be a movie star if I could get out of this place. Now Paul is a real estate novelist who never had time for a wife. And he's talking with Davy, who's still in the Navy and probably will be for life. And the waitress is practicing politics as the businessmen slowly get stoned. Yes, they're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. It's a pretty good crowd for a Saturday, and the manager gives me a smile because he knows that it's me they've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. And the piano sounds like a carnival, and the microphone smells like a beer. And they sit at the bar and put bread in the jar and say, man, what are you doing here? It is, it is life in microcosm for those that are searching, for those that are seeking, for those that are in need of something, for those that convince themselves there's some place, there's some place than where I am right now that I'd rather be. And that might be you. You might be watching, you might be watching this uh, recording and, and thinking to yourself, yeah, I, be, I want my life to be different than it is right now. I want to get somewhere that has meaning and has purpose for me. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to look at this passage that we just read through the eyes of, of the disciples. Obviously, the disciples are with Jesus. In fact, it, in, in verse 37, Matthew tells us that he turned and he speaks to his disciples. Matthew would know he was one of his disciples. And we're not sure if, at least at this point in time, if he is speaking to just the twelve, or we know he had more than just the twelve, but He spends the the bulk of his time on the 12, and by the time you reach chapter 10, he turns and he he selects and, and, and picks out 12 to be those that are closest to him. So what does a disciple do, and how does a disciple approach people? Co-workers, friends, the people you encounter at the red light that are holding up the sign will work for food. 
the people that you walk by in a mall when you walked in the mall, the people that you exchange positions with as you, uh, as you go into a convenience store to buy a Coke, or the people that you're pumping gas and they're on the other side of the pump putting gas in their car. How do you view them? What is your, what, what is your take on others? Okay. I'd like us to look at five privileges of a disciple. The result of walking with Jesus, of following Jesus, of, of being changed by Jesus, of being committed to the mission of Jesus. So, here we go with number one. If you look at verse 36, Matthew tells us when Jesus saw the crowds, let's just stop, call time out. The first privilege of a disciple is to see people, is to see people. Jesus saw people. That word for, for saw is, literally means to observe, to take notice. Isn't it just, does it not kind of blow your mind how when you read about Christ, when, when Jesus was around, people did not go unnoticed. And he just didn't notice the fact that they're there. He looked at them. He, he saw them, but he saw into them. Can I... We're talking about good news. Listen, you need to understand something. You never go unnoticed by Jesus. You never go unnoticed by Jesus. Now, that can be an enslaving certainty, right? Right? I mean, when you live detached from God, from the reality of His gaze, from the reality of His presence with you, it can, it can be like you're wearing shackles. You can never get away because He's there. He sees everything. He knows everything about you. Wherever you go, He is there. But it can also be Incredibly comforting, liberating, releasing certainty when you live in the light of His gaze, when you live in the light of His presence. Jesus is with you. He knows you. He knows about you and what you do. Ask yourself, does that restrict me? Do I feel this weight of burden because Jesus knows and sees me? Or do I, is there a freedom in that? Jesus observed and noticed and saw the people. And that is so, so significant. But here's the second privilege. Not only, not only does Jesus see people, but, but look back down at verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. The second privilege of a disciple is to have compassion on others. To have compassion on others. Jesus sees you, and Jesus has compassion for you. Uh, by the way, this word compassion, it is the same word that's found in Matthew 14 when Jesus is, is, is brought to the point of feeding the 5,000. Um, Matthew tells us that when, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. Same word. It is a visceral word. It is the Greek word, that's about as close as I can get. It's almost an impossible word to pronounce. Uh, but it, it, it means from within your guts, within your bowels, you feel for people. You ever had, you ever experienced something that affected you uh, deeper than your heart? Now, we in English, we tend to equate this word uh, with our heart. We felt it in our heart. But sometimes there's, there's something that goes even deeper than the heart. And the, the, the first century Jewish 
culture, and not just Jewish, just the culture itself, they would designate that as, Man, I feel it in my guts. I feel it in, my, in my, the deepest part of me. Like if you, if you had to get up and speak to people and you were petrified of speaking, it would affect you way, way deep. That's the, the word that's used for Jesus' feeling for the people that he sees. Um, there is a difference between merely looking at somebody and know, knowing that they're present and actually stopping and looking into them and being concerned about them and genuinely, genuinely having compassion upon them. Some are better at that. Some, some people that you've probably experienced in your life just seem like a natural. They, they care about others. And I'm not talking about that kind of dysfunctional sense that offers concern about you in order to get you to have concern about them. I'm talking concern like my grandmother had concern for people. There's a difference. There's a, there, there's a, there's a difference. And I can be guilty of not being genuinely concerned. I, I'll give you an illustration. On Saturday mornings, uh, I, one of the few things I watch f- with Susan that she likes that I really don't care about, uh, we watch a cooking show called Pioneer Woman. And um, I know, guys, i got to turn my, my man card in. I watch Pioneer Woman. But here's m- my thought. It's the least I can do. I mean, I put her through college football in the fall and then college basketball in winter and spring and then the Braves baseball after that and before the Braves season ends we're right back into college football so I'm thinking I can give her 30 minutes to watch a cooking show right but she and I watch this show in a totally different way Susan watches how things are made every little ingredient, while I watch what is being made. I don't really notice the ingredients. I just watch for the final product, and I think to myself, I either like it or I dislike it. Well, sometimes we can go through life and um, we look at others kind of like I watch Pioneer Woman totally oblivious to what's actually happening i'm just looking at big picture and sometimes we can be totally clueless about the people around us in their situation well not so jesus he notices he knows he watches he is never too busy and so if i'm his disciple and I'm following Him, and I'm being changed by Him, and I'm committed to His mission, what does He call us to do? Well, He calls us to see people and to have compassion on those people. Not just fly by. Not just fly by. Notice the words that that Matthew uses. uh, Matthew tells us how this compassion plays out. Two words. He, um, he says, because they, the people, were harassed and helpless. And then he goes on to explain, like sheep without a shepherd. Um, what was it that draws Jesus' compassion? It is the status that the people live in. They're harassed and they're helpless. The word harassed uh, literally means to be bullied, to be distressed. It's a distressed life that the people are living. The word helpless, it's it's an interesting word because it means prostrate. They are unable to rescue themselves. They are unable to escape. They are like sheep without a shepherd. There are no leaders, there are no, there are no leaders in their lives 
pointing them to the truth of God. The people that should be, the Pharisees and scribes, they should have been pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, the promised Messiah. But you know what? They're not only not pointing to Christ, they are obstructing the people from going to Christ. It's a sad situation. And unfortunately, you can find it alive and well in our day. If you're, if you're maybe, maybe you are looking for a church, you're, you're watching me, and maybe you live outside of the CSRA, or maybe you live in the CSRA, and you're just saying, hey, trying to find a place to, to, to worship and to serve God. Can I encourage you? Uh, you need to ask some questions, you know? One question is, where, where, do these, where does this church, where do these people point to? Do they, are they all about events and activities? Do they point to trips, political debates, or do they point to Christ? Where do they, where's, where's the target for these people? Important question to ask. And the second question to ask is, are you humble enough to follow Christ? In our culture today, um, it is not that people are not harassed and helpless. It's not that people aren't distressed and knocked down. It's not that people are not in need of a Savior. Sorry for all the negatives. But rather, it's just that too many people are too proud to admit it. Jesus sees you. And when he looks at you, he doesn't see an object, but he sees somebody of value. Somebody that is created in the image of God. Subsequently, a disciple of Jesus, like his master, like her master, sees people and serves people. Because they don't view others as objects, but as someone of value, created in the image of God. As I was preparing this message, I couldn't help get convicted about the way Jesus sees people and has compassion on people, um, people that are stressed out affected just by the rigors of life. And I thought about our church family here at Kaioki and wonder how many people, followers of Jesus, disciples of his at Kaioki, would claim to care about people's needs without hesitation. But when we hear about needs that are so very evident in our midst, would without hesitation say, oh, I see the needs, but I can't meet those needs. I can't serve in those areas. Um, and I guess, really, that's where, that's where I, I, I want to land here. I want to move to, uh, to verse 37 and give you the third privilege of a disciple Verse 37 says this, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That's just a statement of fact. And so, the third privilege of a disciple is this. A disciple looks for the need. A disciple looks for the need. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, sometimes we wish Jesus would just stop at the harvest is plentiful. But instead, he goes on and he talks about somebody's got to bring the harvest in. He's changing metaphors. He's, he's just used, talked about sheep without a shepherd, but now he changes it to a field that is ready to be harvested, but there's nobody there to do the work. Listen, we have to see people. Um, we have to have, have compassion on people. 
But you think of who it was that ministered to the sick, to the outcast, to the desperate, to those who would come to the end of the reputation game. Um, And what I mean by that is we all know that there are people out there who have just, they're in need, but they're not willing to admit it because they're too proud. They have to look a certain way in the eyes of other people. They would never never allow themselves to admit that they they were in need. But the need is there. Well, Jesus dealt with the misguided. Those who believed the wrong things, those who did the wrong things, adulterers, fornicators, the demon possessed, people that made bad decisions, There are people that live in our area, all around us, in the fields, if you were. They are beaten down. They have been bullied by poor decisions, by their own sin. They have chosen the fleeting pleasures of sin over God and His people. They have placed the wealth of the treasures of this life over the reproach of Christ. They are a part of the fields that Jesus sees. And it's really, it is a sad reality when the field is ready to be harvested and nobody's there to do it. Well, a disciple, like our Master, like our Lord, we see the need for laborers. We see it. I mean, the compassion must compel us to recognize what the need is. And I would just suggest to you that the way Jesus sees people and has compassion on people, the recognition of the need in people, absolutely stands against kind of the natural response that even even Christians have to look down upon people, thinking they're not good enough, thinking those people's clothes are too dirty or too old, their arms are too tatted up, their face is too pierced, their education is too little, they sound different, they look different, their values are different. I don't want my kids to sit with the, the, the people like that. I don't want them to be around that. That's not Christ-like. That's what the people that Jesus had compassion on, that's what they dealt with every day. And that's what people in your midst and my midst deal with every day. Somebody has said people that are not going to act, sa- people that are not going to act saved when they're not saved. So true. So true. So a disciple sees people. A disciple has compassion on people. A disciple looks for the need around them. And fourth, a disciple prays. Notice verse 38. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. A disciple prays, prays, asks God to send laborers out. It is a very personal prayer um, that Jesus encourages and tells us that we are to pray. The need is great. The laborers are few. Pray that God would send laborers. And then here's where we land. Fifth privilege, and it's connected to that prayer. This is really cool, so hang with me, all right? Look at chapter 10. Verse 1. Now immediately Matthew tells us, Matthew's an eyewitness, after Jesus instructs us to pray that the Father will send out laborers, chapter 10, verse 1, he called to him his twelve disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. 
Now look down at verse three, look down at verse five. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now can I make a statement here? It's not that he doesn't love the Samaritans and, and the Gentiles. We looked last week at the fact that after his resurrection, the Spirit was going to come on. The mandate that Jesus gave them was to go to these very people. He's saying, but right now I want you to go, in verse 7, proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at, ha- is at hand. A disciple, the fifth privilege of a disciple is that we go and we speak and we declare and proclaim the same message that Jesus proclaimed. The end of verse 7 say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what was the message that we read Jesus was preaching in verse 35? It's this, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. We don't make this up. We don't have to create a new message. We tell people that Jesus is the answer for their lives. Yes, there's some place else they'd rather be, but they don't know where that place is. They don't know who the the place is. Somebody's got to go to them and somebody's got to tell them And that's you and that's me. So many of us would like to want to see people and have compassion on people and see the need that others have and even pray to the Lord of the harvest, Oh, Father, send out labors. But then we want to stop there. The disciples who saw and developed compassion and saw the need and prayed are now told by the Lord, you are the ones that are to go. You are the laborers that you prayed for. And so I, we close this message simply by saying, we are the laborers. We are the laborers. Be it at a ministry in church, with children, with students, with feeding others, delivering meals to those that can't come for themselves, or whether it's a ministry at the ball field, or at school, or in your neighborhood. We are the laborers if we are His disciples, because we are committed to His mission. And where is His mission? The fields that are ripe for harvest. Let's pray. Father, we come to You beseeching You to send out laborers into Your harvest. God, may we not be negligent, but may we be committed to the mission of Your Son, our precious Savior. And God, may we act, may we see, May you give us compassion. May we recognize the need. May we pray. And then, Father, may we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. We're going to close now uh, in a song of worship. God bless you. May your week be, uh, may your week be rich and deep as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Out of the depths I cry to you In darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy, Lord
for you to count my sinful ways how could I come before your throne yet full forgiveness meets my gaze I stand redeemed by grace alone Will we? 